Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, colleagues in the room and colleagues watching us online on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. My name is Somachi Krisasoloka, Director of Partnerships and Communications at the Tony Elumelu Foundation, the leading philanthropy empowering young Africans from across all 54 African countries. I have worked in the group now for eight years in September, and I think six or seven out of those years closely with the chairman. Um, when I was told to moderate the session, you know, it was weird because I'm always on that side with the chairman, preparing him, working with him for these type of panel interviews. And so to now be on the other side asking the questions is a rare opportunity and I'm very thankful um, for this opportunity. This session is in two parts. I'll go first asking chairman a few questions. I know that a lot of us have written questions to ask him, so I'm not gonna to take too much of your time so that we hurry my part up and go right to you. Um, the way I'm approaching this is a little different, Chairman. You know, you've spoken to us, so we, a lot of us know a lot of your stories. So I wanna ask you questions that we haven't really heard you talk about yet. Um, I thought this would happen yesterday, so I wore my blue jacket, you know, all ready to <laughs> my bottom barrel, as, as Chairman would say. Why look good? But um, it's Saturday, so we're a little dressed down, but it's fine. We were in the nightclub till 2.33 a.m. And I gave myself brain and I said, so much, you better go off there than sleep before this morning. So, Chairman, welcome to the fireside. Um, Thank you, Tomaji. I think the very first question is a question that's in all of our minds. Um, we're in Nigeria, but we're seeing what's happening in Ukraine. Um, we can see missiles, bombing, devastation, destruction. We see babies who are camped out in emergency lorries, people who've just been given birth to. You know, there's a lot of massive chaos going on. And a general silence from global actors. There's nothing strong beyond the usual rhetoric. If you were a global leader at this time, what would you do to de-escalate the situation immediately? No, what's happening in Ukraine is quite uh, unfortunate. And it raises, um, it raises a lot of uh, questions mm -hmm. for, for, for the world. First, we're told about NATO. You know, by the way, so much and I didn't discuss that. I'm just here in this question now. But we're, we're talking about NATO. So what is North Atlantic Treaty Organization about? If you get allies to sign up to support to, to, to agree with you, common defense, common security, etc., and someone, and that Ukraine is uh, being pounded in this manner. And uh, I watch and I say to myself, the president is like pleading for the world to come to his rescue, NATO members, etc. During the U.S. Uh, elections, NATO was an issue because Donald Trump was not interested in NATO, and the uh, Democrats by them made an issue, a campaign issue. And you guys are there now, you're talking about sanctions, you're considering sanctions. And I'm asking myself, where do we go to from here? Are we having a more fragile world, or a stronger world? The geopolitics changing, the dynamics changing. And you know, you ask yourself about, uh, again, this uh, NATO issue, um, if we can come decisively to support this man was his crime that he decided to sign up to s align with you guys. Putin is saying that he's never is weak, that he's vulnerable because his neighbor has, has joined and you guys are not there to defend the neighbor, then there's an issue. I know yesterday somebody mentioned when um, when Osa presented he said that uh, Moyo was asking about World War. And I said, I said my comment from where I started was what, uh, <laughs> World War for World War, that Moyo likes life too much. But this morning, when I was getting ready, I was just thinking about it. And I'm saying, was she really, there's some sense in her apprehension because if Russia is moving this man, in fact, Russia is moving so violently because Putin is now calling on the military in Ukraine to take over. That he cannot negotiate, he called them drug addicts. I cannot, so I'm like, is he Putin setting the agenda now for the world, NATO, etc.? 
and the, the military were to strike or they were to kill the man because the president has said he's not leaving the capital. That he's going to stay there and they're moving in closely. And so if something were to happen to him, NATO will become a toothless bulldog if they don't do something. And Russia has a nuclear <laughs> strength. So, and Putin is strong-headed. Mm -hmm. So you really can't tell where this is going to end. Will sanction alone stop this man from what he's going to be doing? And he has local populism or national sentiments in Russia, as they were told, is positive. But your question is global leaders. If I were one, what would I do to de-escalate the situation there? I think for me now, the time for dialogue, I think, ought to have held prior to this time. In fairness to Putin, he did not move the troops in immediately. He made the noise. China was with him. America, EU on one side. And I think we lost a moment there. I personally, if I were, say, Biden, you know, beyond phone calls, even an agreement to meet somewhere neutral, uh, calling the really China Premier and Putin himself and all that, because world leaders don't stand by and watch the deteriorate region in this manner, especially where you have at the White House a nearly 80-year-old man who is experienced. I would have handled it differently. But now, it is where it is today. I think I would like to see <laughs> force at this point in time my little Moyo's prediction of years. But it might also become inevitable if, uh, but then it will have its own, its own uh, collateral damages. So, maybe dialogue. There will be people that Putin will listen to. In geopolitical tension like this, is give and take. There's something that China wants from America, America should sit with China. There's something also that Russia wants, they should talk. But it should be done in a way and manner that uh, the sovereignty of nation is protected and respected because it's good for humanity, it's good for global peace. So I would say yes, let them have a session. Um, initiated by a global leader like Biden, and then uh, China should be at the table. Russia should be at the table, and I'm sure they can help the world. Thank you, Chairman. Um, second question is bringing it home to Nigeria. 2023. And by the way, I was happy that our, our country at least uh, made, s made a statement. <laughs> I read, uh, I think, this morning, this morning that uh, status quo should remain, they won't go back. But yeah, at least we said something, which is good. Better than being silent. Thank you, Chairman. I'm bringing it home to Nigeria and Africa. 2023 is a defining year for our country. Um, in the past four to eight years, a lot of Nigerians will tell you they've experienced hardship. Of course, hyperinflation, poverty, unemployment, insecurity. What's your counsel for Nigerians as we go to the ballot February 2023 um, and cast their votes in this make or break year for the country? I think uh, first is um, universal adult suffrage. Our people should stop disenfranchising themselves. People should understand the power that we have, especially the the millennials, so to speak. They're no longer millennials because if I, my two daughters are going to be voting next elections, I can't even believe it. And it tells me how things have changed, that powers uh, have changed to a different, different segment. But they don't know yet that they have so much powers. Um, a nation gets the kind of leadership they deserve and deserve. We we have been too politically docile, inactive, non-participatory, and the outcome is what we see. 
So all of these social challenges we have as a people in Nigeria will remain with us if we don't use the power that we have. The power to vote, and this is goes beyond voting, the power to vote and protect our votes. So you vote. We'll have 364 days in a year to do what we want to do. But that one day in four years, so it's like 365 times four. So one out of 365 times four. Let's sit down, vote and sit there. And let them count it. The president yesterday has signed the Electoral Act. And there's a major improvement in the Electoral Act. Electronic transmission of results. So you vote, you sit, they count, they upload, you leave. But first, you must vote. And I think, you know, if people give you bags of rice, bread, um, oil to vote for them, take and eat. <laughs> but when you go there, vote your conscience, vote your future. At times when people come, you know, and they are begging to support them for school fees, etc. There was a time I used to be quite compassionate, but after a while I said, no, because you have conversations with some people and the way they talk, you don't even understand it, you don't get it. So it's like, maybe we should suffer a bit and so that we wake up and begin to realize that one, ethnicity, where you come from, does not change the color of poverty. Religion does not change the color of poverty. What is important is simply the basic human needs, shelter, good life, health, education. Let's focus on all of the let people be able to eat, etc. If no one cares, you see some countries, anyway. So I want to see a 2023 in Nigeria that truly redefined define the future and puts us on a strong trajectory for real economic development that will usher in um, progress, poverty reduction before we talk of poverty avoidance. <laughs> then uh, all the good things we want in life can only come if we have the political sin right. And people don't know the importance of this is, I came into Abuja last week on Sunday. It, it just, I came in, Moseva and I left Lagos 2.33, flew in, finished a meeting here, went back around 6 or 7. It's not something I would have done before because it's kind of, you know, we're talking about 2023. It also I would have done before, I would have said very late. But this is, I'll be failing if I didn't do that because um, it will prevail when good men or good people keep silent, keep quiet. So we need to all be on board, all strata, all categories, all segments. Everyone should be involved, should be concerned about 2023. In your WhatsApp groups, in your different platform you engage in, Let's leave personal animosity. Let's just focus on what is good for Nigeria. Demand and preach, advocate for the right leadership to emerge. Some people will tell you, I'm not going to have lost confidence and that. If you're not going to lost confidence, then so be it for the rest of your life. If we mix 2023 to reset Nigeria, it will be a painful moment in our lives. So it's, uh, it's a unique opportunity. So what I say to Nigerians as we go to, the, uh, to 2023, let's develop and improve our political, our political awareness. Let's be more active. Let us participate. Let's vote. Let's encourage people to vote. Let's leave religion. Let's leave tribe. And let's just vote in someone you believe strongly will help to improve the country. S the fact that someone from your place doesn't make that person a good leader, a good leader. So I hope we, in all of us, let's, let's keep preaching this so that we'll have a better 2023.
thank you for that. Um, next question, still on leadership at that level, is around oil theft. You were in Abuja <coughs> three weeks ago at the National Defense College, and you did say that Nigeria has lost over $4 billion in the last nine months alone. Now, just entering into your mind as a leader, what are some of the things that our government can do quickly to rectify the situation? Because as you said, it's not just only having economic consequences, but also security ones as well. These are people making so much money, faceless. You don't know what they're doing with it. How would you, if you were in that position, immediately rectify this? Honestly, if I were in that position, there won't be an oil theft in Nigeria. You know, you know, it is a national disgrace. I tweeted yesterday. I tweeted yesterday, and I, 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 I called it a, a national shame and disappointment. So it's, I'm not saying it just in this room. I tweeted it. It's a national shame and disappointment, and I called on Nigerian leadership government to do something about it. At the time that oil price is uh, north of at least over hundred dollars, Nigeria should be doing very well. But now we cannot meet our oil, OPEC oil quota when some are begging to have more. We can't meet our OPEC quota, yet we need uh, uh, dollars. Why can't we meet it? Because of the theft that is occurring. People produce, they steal, and it's just unfortunate. It has so many you know, dimensions. But let's say for security, you know, the sovereignty of the country, the security fabric of the country is questioned. And we pray we don't have any insurgency, any, any, you know, at times when our leaders talk from, our, you know, the center, you wonder if they even know what's happening on ground. Because I believe that the ammunition, the armament out there is more sophisticated and stronger than what we even have in our armory. So, um, we pray we don't have problems. We do. People are still making like hundreds of millions of dollars on a daily basis, unaccountable. They don't pay tax. They are faceless. You don't know who they are, but they know themselves. You know, and it makes leadership and governance actually a problem because there's so much out there that you're not in control of. So it's a major issue, and what it requires is just. Um, to remove the indiscipline, the greed, and uh, in the system, you know, people are paid, you know, taxpayers' money pays some salary to people who have the responsibility to maintain, uh, to to provide security, and they are failing to do so. So there should be accountability. You know, we've been discussing since uh, Thursday here. That's the beauty of private sector. Uh, we've been discussing Thursday how to enhance execution, how to entrench uh, accountability, how to make leaders focus on the corporate goals and aspirations. And what are the corporate goals and aspirations for government? Is to make sure better standard of living for your citizenry, good security, good education, certain things that you need to provide them. Those are their KPIs, those are their aspirations. So we'll be meeting, the government should meet. And those who have responsibility for security, they should overhaul it. And it should be top down. There should be commitment, well, genuine commitment, transparent commitment by everyone that this is not good. And what I say to friends is um, it's just myopia, human myopia that is creating these problems. Some of these people, when they are not there again, they go, they go, they go bankrupt. They go, they get poor so quickly. Some of them can't even finance their ticket to travel abroad. And you wonder what they've been doing, all this plundering, like what they've been doing. It's myopia. They get peanuts from all of this. The people behind it, you know, get a lot more and manage in a better way. But they get peanuts and you mortgage the future of the country. The resource that should, the oil resource that should, we should is, and it's for a period, because we've been discussing here this transition, it's not going to last forever. We're borrowing money from China and other countries when on our own we have the natural endowment to give us that money, but we refuse to do the right things. So for me, it's just a manifestation of indiscipline, greed, and um, purposelessness. 
lack of purpose in leadership. They should do something about it to save everyone the national disgrace and embarrassment. Transitioning now to private sector, you often talk about your intolerance for political organizations. Organizations are overly diplomatic, where you have cliques and clans and gossip and idle chatter here and there. But human beings are naturally political. True. Naturally wanting to affiliate with who seemingly has the most power. How do you identify this indiscipline? And how do you make sure you excise this virus immediately? <laughs> I think uh, I often say that the corporate place is not a political arena. Corporate uh, place is not where you have political diplomacy. And if someone wants to be a diplomat, you can apply to Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> there are many vacancies there <laughs> for that. But as you said, it's, um, they exist. When it's positively aligned, it can be good. But it's also when you ride the tiger, you have to be careful when you ride the tiger because the tiger can turn and devour you. So if you ride it as a leader because you think it's, it's aligned with what you want to achieve, it can create problems also. So my philosophy has always been in leadership. You know, first, I started from, and I'm always now proud to say so, I started as an, from entry level. So I have seen how organizations work, operate. You know, if you start from mid or senior level, you miss that moment. So because I've seen how it works, I know things that need to be emphasized, things that should be emphasized. I've seen also, I've been part of an organization that had a lot of promise and couldn't go far. And so, on my own, I do an assessment. Why didn't this organization become hugely successful? It's because of the issues we've been discussing since Thursday here, because of internal squabbles, because of people not working as a team, because of unnecessary, of, of an un totally unnecessary politics. And most times, it's because people are trying to not curry, but get the attention of the ultimate leadership. And so if you now are opportuned to get to that leadership level and you do not dismantle if there exists such traits and blocks, then you're building to fail. I have seen you know, great institutions, you know, people all like gossiping. And you know, that's why when people come to me and say things, I'll ask you, Okay, let, I will invite one, two, three, let's have a meeting. You say no, I pass. Because if you come to me, Sam did this. Okay, I'm sorry. I won't even make a judgment. I won't say that is very bad or something. I won't. I'll say, let's, let's call Sam. If you're straightforward, you shouldn't be a problem. If you say no, I pass. And I won't sleep, I will sleep well. Because you want to crack my brain, what I, my head, what I don't need, and you're telling me just for your information. So how can that be for my friend when I can apply it? You work with it to change, to 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 change it, to correct it, because it might still keep, keep happening. So I believe, you know, some call it office policy, some call it psychophancy, some call it you know, gossip, in different names in the workplace. They exist, but because we are bidding to last, and because one has seen firsthand, firsthand, I've seen how it works and how it is institutions. Because at times, people who are not so strong in certain areas can use all of these approaches to confuse a leader. So you need to try, it's God ultimate, but you need to try to detach to look at things very well. And where you need to intervene, you intervene to correct. Most times what I try to do is, you know, 
we put the fish on the table, we deal with it, and we bring peace. You know, just guys, let's work together. You can't and that. But let everyone, and it's also good for people to know what the sensitivities that others feel about certain issues. Where institutions that are not together, I almost always hold the leadership accountable for that. Because as you said, human beings are political in nature, we are social animals, we relate with our societies and what happens around us, our environment, and it takes a detached person to make sure that the interactions that occur in that environment are in line with what we want to have. If you see they are not, you try to correct it. So yes, politics is it. But I think across our group, I think across our group, we are not political. Yeah, in fact, it's almost uh, it's very significant, statistically insignificant. In fact, it can be up to, compared to what you see in other places, we have nothing. In fact, I must commend all of you. It's, uh, it's, uh, and it's become, to me, uh, it's an enduring, it's becoming an enduring you know, culture and uh, practice in our group. People, if <laughs> you've not seen things in the organization, if you hear what happened, in other, that's why even when new people come to our organization, it takes them time to open up. Because from where they are coming from, you know, it's like some people might even think they're setting a trap. <laughs> but <laughs> so how do you just pick up like that? <laughs> it doesn't happen. But we have tried, and it's good that all of us going to work together to make this a part of uh, who we are. Somebody spoke today or yesterday that environment, I think today, Mr. Shegmu or also someone, that the environment help, the environment can help to engender productivity. So when you look at the environment, it's not our physical environment, it's even about the idiosyncrasies in an environment, the ethos, the pattern, the ways, written and unwritten, how things are done. And so people blossom and do very well when they're in a professional setting. Most people. Those who don't do a professional setting are, you know, are not meant for this kind of organization, this kind of group. Whenever, in my quiet moment, I almost I always x-ray our leadership, like the CEO. I'm like, this person can do and be like, and I, you ask me, how do I see? I observe certain things. There are so many decisions that I've made. You can tell whether there's any personal bias or interest. Honestly, and I think I say the way it is, I've not seen across and if I see, I will deal with it immediately. I've not seen any leader, I think. In fact, um, all her leaders, in terms of like, um, for instance, there are some organizations where the, at my level, they be concerned about professionalism in procurements, concerned about professionalism in recruiting, concerned about professionalism in appointments, concerned about professionalism in promotions. In this, I've, there's no, no segment of us, our company, where I have that concern. For instance, we spend a lot on vendors across our group. Transcorp Power is one of our biggest spenders. Since we started in 2012 or 2013, I, Dr. Lumel, my family, nobody has ever introduced one vendor, one contractor. The CEOs are here. I've never asked anybody who is, nobody, I don't know who the contractors are. There's a process, and I believe in the process. If I don't believe in the process, I'll change the leadership easily. I have the authority to do so. They spend huge, I'm sure Transcorp power, uh, not less than a, a lot of money, you know, like billions on quarterly, almost quarterly basis. I have that confidence because of the people running it. 
and the process were put in place. Transco, no, um, S oil and gas. In fact, we were discussing two days ago. And I think here in Abuja, we were discussing with John Lunch or something. Osana and were saying some things that I said, I think here, they were talking about number of contracts they award, number of contracts. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> they were saying about certain policy contracts. So I said, do you work contracts like that? He said, yeah, that's why they keep the business uh, going. I've never, as oil and gas, I have never, 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 I don't know who the contractors are. I don't know who they work with. <laughs> there. But we have put a process that I have confidence. The day I doubt it, you see, I just say, okay, guys, enough. We change the process immediately. But I've never. In fact, Peter, the ten oil, I'm sure they are all contracts on now that we're getting to first oil, they are all a lot more contracts, millions of dollars, etc. I don't know one contractor that they work with. One I don't know. And and it comes when Peter said you guys I put subject to the concurrence of ENN. Because I know it will go through normal process to do so. Afriland, they have property, they build, they do everything. My elder brother is a builder, consumer, but I drew like I think the only corner my elder brother ever did for her group was um Transco Park, South Quarter or something. And on that I said no. ENN came back, made a case, etc. I said, for me, why no? Because I don't want if the job is not right, we will not be scared to I said, let him go. I can't even have him look for a contract elsewhere. But UNA is when that's okay, handle. I don't want to get involved in some that. So those are every area of our business. In fact, the only thing any member of my family does, my sister that supplies, I think, hampers and rice <laughs> when Mother got to UBA during Christmas. Again, all the contrasts in UBA everywhere. I don't know anything. But the, because I believe, again, the process, the CEO UBA, he went to my own school. He will do better than even me. So ENN will do better than myself. So why do, should I be involved in all of that? So that's how I believe we should operate. So I think when I assess the group, Transco Hotel, yeah, before even Dubai took over, a cousin of mine supplies things. So he says I should introduce him to Val, or when, I think Val or something. And I said to him, I will introduce you, but you go through their process. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, he doesn't talk to me again. Because he must have gone through their process and they didn't find okay. But he don't talk to me again. But I move on, you know, because if I want to dash money to him and his family, I would do so. But it will not affect her around the business. Even TF, I have people from the Lumelu, a very big family. You know, so what I did. I didn't even get you by I set up a family foundation. I put money there. My elder brother and some other from different parts of the Elimelu family, I put them there. And I said just for two purpose reasons. One, people want to go to school, they should pay school fees for them to level four degree level. And two, you want to start small business, or the fifty thousand, hundreds, no more than that. You should do so, just so that I don't put any pressure on TF. And so, if <laughs> the Melu family about how they came, they want, uh, I said, apply. If they take you, go through, you succeed. But me, to go to the intervene. And that's why I can boldly say today, we have empowered over 15,000 young Africans. I did not recommend one person as a beneficiary. You go through, you qualify, fine. You don't go through, you call, you go through, you don't call. Recruitment. My elder brother's daughter, a lawyer, <laughs> she wants to work with uh, HHOG. I said uh, HHOG interview her. They interviewed her, Orinda and Co., etc. They said, 
sorry, she's okay, but not quite okay for the kind of person they need for that for legal room. In fact, but my people know the moment it came, I, s I said I will put you through the process. If you make it, I don't. And so when the result came, I just forwarded it, and everyone understood that and they respected that. But do not stop me from doing what I should do for my niece, you know, and in so many other 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 ways. I think if we all continue this way, leadership, making the right decision, this hotel, I stayed in this hotel, I pay. This hotel, I pay. I eat food in this hotel, I pay. And so what I always say is if I hold myself to that level of accountability, <laughs> then uh, the boy can tell me otherwise. And so it starts from the head. Because we live in a society where there's a lot of pressure on people. So when you live in this kind of society, you must operate in a certain fashion so that you also help others. Because Dubai can ask it, and, ah, my chairman even pays when these things there. So I bet I don't put me under this uh, pressure. So in everything we do, we pay. The everything, every hundred percent. I pay COT or when there was COT in UBA for my transactions and co. So we try to operate. That's how to be true. So back to politics. Uh, I went this far so that we understand all of these issues. The and so many things, you know. <laughs> When we were discussing Peter Shade's appointment, uh, you heard someone was supposed to be there, but we decided. And I'm also blessed with a wife that's very professional like me, because I can't do this alone, or there will be tension at all. <laughs> but we discussed, and totally both aligned the same way. But this has been to happen. And it helps, it reinforces when you see success. So if Peter didn't do well, you know, it shakes you, you, you it shakes your decision making ability. But if it does well, you say, wow, okay. Then on and on. And Abele today is regional CEO for UBA East Africa. He put people where they are very strong and it helps this entire system. And that's why when somebody was speaking in to them about feedback, it's so critical for progress and for development. But in a nutshell, organizations do have professional politicians. <laughs> we are lucky that we don't have it. But it's work in progress, and that, okay, luck, but it doesn't just, it didn't just happen that way. That luck was deliberate that will only put the fish on the table. That as leaders we will, if you see the way I view about it, I can come, <laughs> I'll tell you, think that, anyway, that leaders, we just need to give everyone the opportunity to know, um, to do what is right, encourage people, and uh, not, not, not give too much room for people because time when this when I was CEO of UBA and I was leaving UBA, when I was leaving after we appointed Philip, just so and let me share this because it's good for for us to understand the heart of man, how good or bad it can be. At times, you know, when certain conversations are being held, and some people in their mind say it must be this person, I always laugh. And for me, I don't operate that way because I've seen a lot in my life. At times, when you think you're hearing something like without feeling, and some might say this must come from this person, it might not be the that person. So it's always good to give everyone the benefit of that and have an open mind. So when I was leaving UBA, so they announced. The, we announced my successor CEO within 24 hours. And when I, I was in Abuja here, I flew back to Lagos. So, so 
The next day, before the board meeting, everyone in the had heard why the emergency board meeting coming. Someone came to me within the EB organization and said that we had two DMDs. Uh, the person said, I'm sure it's going to be one of the two then, but I want to s advise you strongly that it should not be Filippo Doza. So I said, why? He said, you know, so the person, w <laughs> the heart of man is wicked. The person, the person walked closely. I did not tell Filippo Doza that until he sent forth, after his tenure as CEO UB, when I told him this. He came to the thing and I told him this. So I, he said, you know, I work closely with him. He knows my boss, but he would destroy this institution. His mind, his heart, his body. And if you heard that from somebody who worked closely with somebody, you have to have God's, uh, <laughs> God's uh, love and uh, wisdom to rise above it. So I said, okay. He said, don't. So I thanked the person. I said, okay, thanks so much. Have a nice day. We went into the board meeting, and of course, I proposed Phillips as CEO. Would I even know whether that, what the person said was true or wrong? And we appointed Philip as the CEO. Why did I do so? I've worked with this person. I have my own. That's why we tell me about another person. I said, keep quiet. Because if you work with people, if you know me, I'm a bit, people around me, if you watch, are people that I've known for some time, you know, and it grows. So all of us are working together now, and then I'm new, we know each other, and it builds like that. So there's a keen order. I can't just overnight, you know, dump this card others uh, someone because of a new person. It's, there's a keen order, and it's normal in life. So, I've worked with Phillips for some time. I didn't know. I just, anyway, I worked with him for some time, and I, th I like the way he makes decisions and everything. So, went in, and above all, you have to be God to know the truth. So, I just went in. But this person is supposed to like be coming from point of view of, I know him very well, and I want to help you not to make it wrong. <laughs> but I didn't take it. So, we appointed Phillips. Now listen to this. So we appointed Philip in January, toward the end of January, and my last day was July. And uh, around May, we started making appointments, you know, the transition appointments. <laughs> I think I had to go, you know, well, chief of staff to. So when I was CEO, ENM was my chief of staff. And I wanted to, and I was working under ENN, and they helped me set up a formidable office. So I wanted to move like that. But, you know, it's like what happened when I interview people, I might be interviewing someone for a certain company, I say, let's move to another company. So whilst I knew that ENN and IO would make life so easy for me in the new place, but um, BB also needed them. So, I had to leave ENM behind. But Ayo, I wanted to go with Ayo. So I told Philip, Philip begged me, said, please. Ayo knows, which is true in organization. He knows how to make school, this and that. I'm new here, so I need him to. I said, okay. And I said, Ayo, for the time being, stay. <laughs> and then when Philip was going to Nova, Philip moved Ayo to Nova. I said, Philip, that's not the deal. <laughs> that you use that. And that's I just became the ED and COO, chief of at Nova Bank. But the time was okay, Philip, I'm taking Ayo back. Let's bring him back. So after Ayo was appointed, if you that, <laughs> this same person that said I should not appoint Philip CEO came to me to say, please, I want to work. So what Owen was doing for me as HR advisor, I want to be appointed HR advisor to Philip. I was very shocked. I said, okay. I said, okay, I will discover with him. You know, it's an appointment to make, I will discover with him. And I left him. And of course, I didn't discover with Philip until six years after. And I didn't, that is discovered to even say, appoint this person. And if he even, 
Oh, then there was a day. So I think when the person not was coming, we went to meet Philip for appointment. And Philip came to me with a list of the appointment he wanted to make and put the person in his office and then I canceled it. He said to you, you come and I said, I can't, I didn't say anything. And leader at times also, you don't, you know, I can't do say anything, I said, just leave this. And you, some of you know I do certain things. I just said things and at times if it's too sensitive, to you, I just removed that thing. I just removed it. So it was, he sent for party that, you know, as a sit <laughs> when I discussed it, he was shocked. I said, to me, how can the person who didn't want you to be appointed as you work in your office? That is, you fail. I can't let that happen. So we have all these animals in organizations. But they do well if leadership gives them the room. If leaders give them the room to do so. We have, in our organization, so it's good to have divergent views. And I do encourage it a lot, but I like it on the table. So that that person will have the opportunity to defend himself or herself. Otherwise, it can be misguided. So yes, it's an issue, about um, institutions should learn how to deal with it. And leaders, it happens in everyone's organization. Uh, all of the organization happens. And because the problem, I call it car uh, back carrying staff. When you have, depend on the leader and the, the leader's learning, when you have the whole carry back, so especially women. Honestly, you know, if people talk about hair or they carry back for you or they do this for you, I think people get carried away. And they understand your vulnerabilities, your weakness, and who can you, you just tweak it gradually without you knowing. And then they start feeding your ears with what is not necessary. And you start acting in a certain way. You know, just like all these people who go to Celestia Church, all these churches, everybody say, everybody's a witch and a, and co. You start, you, you begin to live another person's life, not your life again, because everybody's a witch. So we need to be very careful about, about this. Leaders need prayers. <laughs> because there's a lot. There's a lot. You need to have the wisdom of God and the calmness of mind and him too. And also strong object lessons of objectivity. I can go out I'll go, I can go out to party with you today. Tomorrow if you need to be disciplined, I'll discipline you ten times over. Totally. There are lines we don't cross. There are lines we don't cross. So leaders must know this. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, the next question is about leaders in our group. And the last three days learning session, we've come to understand the role of our CEOs in setting the vision, in driving the, um, the, um, the business, and also in ingraining the culture. Chairman, when you find that the leaders you've appointed are not meeting these expectations that you have for them and the organization, how do you tow that thin line between further developing and capacitizing them and beginning the transition process where you exit them out? I think, uh, I think um, hallmark of leadership, I believe, is in being fair and firm. You know, you appoint someone, you make a judgment. And of course, the way we appoint is not just as the spirit leads. You see certain attributes. You look at certain job. You look at what it takes to take to succeed in that job. You look for who has those uh, attributes, and you appoint the person, and you help to capacitate to support the person, and you know, open policy, open door. You can understand that because, and you give the person latitude too to be himself or herself because. Uh, to experiment what, before I became CEO, I had my own personal agenda that if I ever get to the top, things I would do differently. And so I got to the top, I had the opportunity to do those things differently. That was why yesterday I asked somebody, I said, what is the role of the group? The influence of the group, I think symbol of someone. I said, what is the influence of the group and what you do? Because I want to also know whether we're stifling people's initiative, creativity, you know, in running their business. OSA CEO, HHOG, we have regular update meeting, you know, monthly or thereabout. 
And that's it. I don't want to get to more. And if he's succeeding and I can see learnings from his success, I take from it, we add to what we have. Because I'm not the only one who knows the right thing to do on leadership. We have seminars, we listen to Peter Shade, taking certain things. We listen to Osa, we listen to Simbo and Co. Next time we have a session, we listen to others. I want to, by God's grace, call Owen or someone say, tell us how you took our power back to 1,000 megas a day. Dubek, tell us how you, you know, uh, set up this in uh, Lagos and suddenly this and that happened. So, leadership goes that way. And when people get appointed and I give them this space, I monitor, you see the performance, I do check-in, I would say, okay, and somehow it's what I do a lot, you know, just appointed almost 12 CEOs in UVA, African countries. So then we do check-in, come present our journey so far, how are we doing? Oliver, how is this one doing? This is how you doing? You know, Ian, how is this one doing? Can we have a session? Oh, and how is Vincent doing? Can we have a session to see, to know? And you are assessing, you've got a leader and go. And if you think someone is derailing, uh, I, I can be quite ruthless in the uh, issue of um, certain, I say, the discipline of correcting myself. If I've been a mister, I corrected. But interestingly, <laughs> as you ask this question, I'm just thinking through all the CEOs. Honestly, Honestly, I don't, I don't want to know or remember if I've changed a CEO, a CEO before the end of the person's tenure. I don't think there's one. At the foundation, when we were left, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, Reed, Mr. Reed, that was appointed the CEO. And I think, we dropped him under one month or thereabout. About one month, we dropped him. We, it was so clear that we made a wrong decision. Because the person who was number one of the directors at the foundation, we saw a different, it got too authoritarian, it got it, 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 totally different. And <laughs> the foundation is uh, it's like alter ego. It's like the foundation is something we can't joke with. You know, at all. It's, no, no, it's like a marine call. So, uh, no way. So, immediately, we had a conversation. And it's not difficult for me to have conversation with people. Because for me, it's a contract. If you fail your own part of the contract, I shouldn't feel bad in failing uh, doing my own part. So, and before I appoint anyone to leadership, I always have conversations so that we understand especially on everything. And so we had conversation, tough conversation, that's and that, and thanked him. And people were saying, but no, to, to within one month change the financial to I said, sorry, aside the leprous finger earlier now before it gets too bad. And we did just that. So I think, I can't remember if any other time I've had to change a CEO before it went tenure. So it means, therefore, if it means, does anybody, I don't think any, I don't think there's anyone. So it means, therefore, that either a process, not either, a combination of factors. One, process or appointing them. Two, the individuals, you know, are the right people for those roles. I mean, just think of Peter Shadi's appointment. From registered business to <laughs> running a conglomerate, we've seen now, Peter, your share price was 14 naira yesterday, so running from registered business to now go and run as the group CEO of United Capital. And if you listen to the scorecard, Owen from the hotel CEO to Nandi Group CEO of Transco. I recall uh, <laughs> Owen's appointment. So I called her 
and I said, um, who within a wider group do you have in mind, do you think can be the, once you're my HR director, advisor, it's almost forever. There are, there are, there are certain meetings I say, I don't went to this meeting because I want to benefit from the residual knowledge and the brain. So I said, who do you think uh, across the group? He said, George H. I said, no, group plus UB plus everywhere that we can make the CEO of Transcom, that I want ENN at the center. <laughs> that cool. So we started discussing, uh, no, Val was going to, but even before then, we started discussing, and so she mentioned one uh, executive director at UBA. So I asked her to come and see me. I discovered Dr. Elimelo. I said, uh, this vacancy is coming up. This and the, these are the candidates. I'm, I want you to think. What conversation? So, when came? Mm -hmm. So, when the one came, I said, uh, so let's go back to that conversation. So, Susan, she uh, mentioned the person again. I said, any other person? She said, Transco is a big, she doesn't say anything. Else. So, no, then. After the email, I discovered ENN. I discovered ENN too. <laughs> so we landed. So, and I said, so what of you? He <laughs> said, no, but she's in the transcode the PLC. I said, yes, who said you cannot move up to, to, to the group level? And that's how it happened. Okay. Then once things up like that, I sit you down and I tell you what I expect, what I expect, how you operate, how and that. And I also tell you, your weaknesses and tell you about that you need to work on this and why i always say that where i give hardly any ceo here that i don't know the weakness he or she possess even as i'm going to go through this evaluation for i can tell most of what they said by certain people but just that i expect to see improvement you know so i i always give people the opportunity in spite of because if I had my own boss, they would see also some weaknesses that I have. And the fact that someone has a weakness does not make the person less a leader. And it actually makes you human. But what is important is, someone said it well here, yeah, about being self-aware and also having your own personal commitment and agenda that you improve yourself and checking yourself from time to time. It's not easy, but it's not impossible also. Anyway, so I think we have been lucky that our CEOs have not had cause so far to change any. They run their course and in any case also with reinforce and where we need to make change you know if you give people honest feedback all the people who report that to me they know how i feel about certain aspects of them 100 percent they know how i feel i'll say you this <laughs> you this you this you know um yeah so we're lucky but we have had to make as i said not just at CEO level, below some some tough decisions, you know, when 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 it is necessary to do so. But I like the professionalism of our leaders in the group. I like their hard work. I like so at times when I see some of this survey, their feedback, you know, I'm like, in fact, there's one something I wrote there. So I will discuss it more. But, but let me discuss it openly about about empathy. In fact, some group, I think. It's, uh, Ibuku's group or someone's group had commented, proposed that we should measure leaders on their, not emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence or empathy, emotional intelligence should put as one of the KPIs, assessment uh, criteria for the leaders. You know, in leadership, both private and public, there are certain latitudes you give to leaders. Otherwise, you can begin to breed unintended consequences. In fact, if you notice the way I speak always, I'm always concerned about unintended consequences. Because most times you set out to do something this way, before you know you've created some problems that you don't 
you never anticipated. When you begin to measure a leader, as it relates to financial reward, certain things, on, say, empathy, it's a critical requirement you want for a leader, like a CEO. But you need to be careful how it's measured so that the person does not turn the organization to a political organization. That decisions, the person would have. So my boss sent me home. As an analyst, I, I keep telling you guys, I've said this. My boss sent me home. I was wearing a one nylon silk uh, <laughs> shirt that I thought was my bottom bar shirt. No, no, that was stupid shirt <laughs> that I was wearing. I was wearing one gold, you know, those vast type of shoes I was wearing. <laughs> I was wearing those shoes, but I don't wear those shoes again. I laughed at you, I played it and stuff. I was wearing those kind of shoes, thinking that I was looking good. And my boss said to me, that, hey, 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 Tony, <laughs> he said, I've been keeping quiet, but it's so the poor man has been, he's been keeping quiet. quiet that, no, 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 you have to go, you have to go, you have to go and change. It might, that is, those days, you know, you managed to enter public transport to get to work, and so we're not sending you back. And if you, and you know those days, at time, those buses, when the boys were there, when they have reached like uh, CMS, you know, just uh, CMS, jump, you get the CMS, they know I, I, our TB at Tababala, so they'll pack, at the time they'll pack their team maybe later in the day before they start moving. How will I go home? <laughs> the man sent me home. Come and tell me to assess that man that day, if I, I did assess <laughs> Our, our, our build nonsense out of him that, that day, then the organization will not use it to say that it's a bad. But today, sitting here, I thank God, I thank him for that. And I said to Modubani, you need to send me home too. My boss sent me home and he changed my life. That was when I started knowing that I go and buy a second hand white shirt and wear a white shirt. That's what you should wear as a professional. Wear a blue shirt or light blue shirt. And, I, and stop wearing all those gold uh, plated. <laughs> <laughs> all those uh, gold plated nonsense. I <laughs> for sure I should not wear. It took me. It was hard. But someone was asked me to admit any question that they would tell you how bad their leader is, etc. So we need to be careful. The right thing is we need to coach our leaders to coach our leaders we must not incapacitate our leaders inadvertently and make them become shadows on their side there's something we saw in those leaders that pointing to those offices the moment we lose and kill that then those people will fail i won't do it so i wrote certain things down that we'll do i said they will not do simple hard hr manager one lady one day the lady sent in a letter that she was resigning. I can't remember whether 2013 or was that one black big lady. Oh, when you push your nose, know, but what's your, what's her name? What? Jumoke. So I call when things happen like that. Yeah, Simba is too this. And I'm just giving Simba that feedback first time today, in 2013. And I said. The lady left, and she wants to, she said, why? Because the work environment. I said, okay. But let's just make sure, just observe for that month and make sure that it's not a pattern. It's simple. Because leadership is tough. If you do make jerk reaction, you can even create confusion in the system. We just celebrated Simba as one of our best leaders. That does not mean she does not need have improvement areas like Tony Lumelo and others. But we take things one step at a time and look at things and look at what's affecting a certain action and reaction and take things from there. So I thought I should say, but again, for our CEOs, I'm largely, if there's any area, in, and if you notice, anyway, if there's any area we're highly perceptive, if there's any area requiring or to fine tune and go, we do so.
In fact, ENN is a strong uh, gatekeeper. In fact, some of them <laughs> find it easier to deal with me than to deal with ENN. <laughs> so between us and the system we have, I think, I think, I think we're good. But again, I want to urge everyone, let's keep improving. You know, leaders get things done through others, through people. If we don't have the right, if we don't manage our people well, they can't, they can't surpass, deliver. In fact, when tea break, this short tea break we had, I was outside with Chris, and uh, he said, this decision to move the going back to Monday for people, that is so good because he was already thinking how to fly to Port Harcourt and go from Port Harcourt to worry because in there to this and that to go back. Because the flight to Port Harcourt and worry were full and cool. And I said, no. Then someone asked me, he said, what of all the juniors are can we also? I said, it's for everybody. But it takes, so if there is emotional intelligence, social intelligence, let's keep improving on it. It takes a certain level of mindset to think of some of this, you know, this, and okay, this, okay, maybe we we'll do this. So for leaders, So we are, we are special people. Leaders must, it's like those days you watch some of these uh, traditional uh, drama movies here about how they can a leader. You go through certain processes because you're not just, they won't prepare you. If you, if I don't know some of you read Loves and Rampart, then yeah, about Tibetan and the monasteries had the groom leaders. It doesn't just happen. So when you become a leader, if you've not been groomed, you groom yourself. You read about, just pick two, three, four, five books of other great leaders. And just read. Let read. Let that be part of your own development to know how special you are. And then the way you begin to think must change from the ordinary. Because a lot is now on you in providing the guidance and leadership that will help people to match behind you to execute and deliver on your aspirations. So all I'll just say to our leaders, we're doing well, but let's keep improving. There's room for improvement. You are not a man of many regrets. Um, I followed you around the world, and one question you keep getting is, do you have any regrets, any business mistakes you've made? But one thing you have said, though, is that you were giving opportunity at a very young age. You were, bank ma you were branch manager at 26. You keep saying that you're not sure that you've been able to replicate that opportunity that you were granted at such an early age in the lives of those who work with you and those who you know. So I want to ask you, why is this so? And what are you doing to correct this? <laughs> I'm sure the lot of young women are good with thank you for this. Yes, um, you know, it's self introspection, self um, assessment. You know, um, juries out there, the future will tell. And I, but it's a question I keep asking myself, I keep challenging those around me that they should, we should keep working on or reviewing. Have we? Can I say that I've created the same kind of career progression opportunities that I had? I give, I have my own personal answer. Um, at times I tell myself, is it, am I being too hard on myself and the system, or is that real? I just pray that. I succeed, or I know I will succeed in doing so, but that I have done some already. I hope that I've done some already in creating, in creating um, other leaders, the way, not just creating the giving people early opportunities. So all around our group, both here and even United Bank for Africa, is something progressive that I've been speaking more about the UBA, the HH Academy, and the Young Graduate Program were about to launch. I hope will be 
the beginning of an institutionalized process for making this happen. I know prior to now, we've made some appointments, we've given others opportunities, but I don't think personally that the scale is at the level that I would like to see yet. Each time, and at times that frustration comes through when I'm, when I'm, the line they don't know the, when I'm seeing recommendations for placement, and they know this. I, for me, when I say that we prioritize our people, it's not just a cliche, it's not just talking because people say that. I do believe so strongly. So, for the first time, to even say it today, just in case people don't know. I know, I know people don't know because they don't sit there when these decisions are made. There's no, when we want to hire and recommendations for placement come from where um, first thing I'll ask them is who is this person equivalent in our group or our company? In fact, there's hardly a day we don't mention Moya and Ibuko in our discussions. Oh, they are here. They will tell you, um, Olambia and um, uh, will say this. I say, so this person, how does this person rank? In fact, uh, I think there was even someone who didn't hire because we wanted Modubai, Buko and Moya promoted for hire that person. I said, for no, the person did that. I can't sleep with seeing this kind of person come to become, to come in at their level, you know, because that there should be premium that you've even worked with us in comparison number of years, they should premium rather than someone from our side go on to our side, we can't do that. At times it's frustrating to the HR organization when I take this position, but they understand too. It is important that, never I said this, I said no, no, we can't, no, we can't hide this into the group because there are better people, there are people who are this and that, can, can, at this level, no, no, I won't do so. And at times, leaders will be justifying why it should be so. I take that position because I want to make sure that those who have decided to pitch their future with us, that they don't regret it. You hear so much. I'll tell Modubran, I'll say, you know, I think it's not about Monda so much you doing what she's doing. Because I subscribe to certain journal. If you're like a Yale, Harvard, Ivy League, MBA, there's certain salary you earn after some years. Is that? I say it's not. I say it's because the, I say, so let's see how quickly without disrupting our system we can accelerate that progression. Because that is true. So when people who are close to us, who are with us, I try to make sure, and it's a bit uh, funny because, you know, it's, it's almost like, are you being clannish? But the truth is, when we say that we prioritize our people, we must live by it and demonstrate it in everything. means those who are with you should not be worse off because they are with you. Let's give them the opportunities first, especially if they are good and hold promise. If they are not, it's different. Today, I say to Mondubai and always, you know, your HR person will always chatting. And at times, to if I say, you know, there was a time at TF we had leadership, uh, sil not silly, but layers. And w I said to them, we need to remove layers. And so posted people, if I'm in Aura, NECA, doing it. And that's why you see when people, when they go like that, I keep asking about them. So how they doing, how they doing. And I was very happy to hear the validation about NECA's performance yesterday or two days ago. They moved, we moved up Ibuku and Moyo. Others came under them. So everyone is progressing, is moving. 
when you were president, I said, I'm entrepreneurship manager for TF. I said, wow, 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 wow. That's good. So we're giving opportunities, but I want us to give more. And thanks for asking that question. I want, I want to see, and I think it's happening, but I know there's a lady, I can't remember, is it John or something that they moved from Transco Hotel Abuja to Ijoma? Then there's a lady also, HR lady too, that moved to. So we're seeing this, but we need to accelerate, we need to see more in terms of opportunity for our people. In fact, there was somebody wanted to hire for finance. I said, this person and uh, Christiana, who is senior, who is better, why should we do this? I think that was even last week or two weeks ago. So we need to give opportunities to our people, but we need to institutionalize it. And I think that process just begun, has begun with um, the leadership uh, HH um, Academy and also the young professionals. I was 12 months after school when I became a manager, brand manager. I want to ought to see even like we just we should say if someone spent ten years maximum the event can be a CEO. We can say that and work towards that and develop the person. We can say five years maximum the person can be this. For instance, I look forward to the next future uh, CEO of um, of a TF after FM coming from within. If we cannot groom our own CEO at this time then we're not doing well enough. We we'll have enough time to plan all of this. So let's continue. It's, HR Mobile needs to help me, please, because my own personal fulfillment, you know, but we have not achieved that. I, maybe I'm being too hard, but I think it's right. We have not achieved that the way I want to see it. That three, five years after someone had joined up on Sky, they should be ready for certain reasons. An institution that run this well, even their staff costs will be low. And then culture issue will be even easy to manage because you're not buying every second and go. So it's a uh, work in progress, but there's a strong realization that um, it has to be done. I mean, we're looking for CTO from a power business, etc. We acquired a power business in 2013. This is 2013. 21st business 2022. We shouldn't really be looking for people from our side again. But it has to be deliberate. So there's room for improvement in this area across the board. And I believe the leadership of our HR leader will help. The COP is being challenged here. Yeah? Welcome to you guys, even though that we have plenty of job today in the group. The Gloria today is a uh, HR manager for S Insurance. It's a thing of joy and fulfillment to me. I saw Edit, you know, in fact, quite professorial. And I was just, I just tell me, it just happening. When you see these tra leadership transitions happen, even when Moyo presented, I like what Moyo said. He said, everyone at HH Group is a leader. That was a profound statement. So sh the presentation is not looking at some people only. It's looking at almost everyone of us. So it is a calling or a responsibility or a purpose that I need others to help me realize so that, you know, I want us to celebrate this person joined or just within five years this has happened. Uh, but we have to be deliberate about it. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. We'll save the rest for the book that's coming out very soon. Ladies and gentlemen, I honestly know my... Know my not my, not my wish, but uh, left to me, I would have liked her to stay and finish all of the questions. But uh, the, day, the day is gone, and uh, the tomorrow has reminded me.
uh, by the evening or have personal have to sleep and I'm sure some of you want to sleep before then. So Sumachi, you want to yeah, close for Yes, let me close the family. So on behalf of the entire Air Holdings Group, Chairman, we want to thank you for giving us this rare insight into your mind to see how you work, to see how you think, to see how you make decisions, so that when us two go back to our work and our day to day, if we can stay if two of you were to do this, how would he do it? So thank you so much, Chairman, and see you soon at seven o'clock. She did this work well, though. She did, she did this work well. She did this work very well. <laughs>